I visited India for the first time back in 2004. And truth be told, it's a trip that almost didn't happen. I had been traveling the world for about a year after selling a company, and candidly, I was getting a little tired of it, and I wanted to get back home. But my girlfriend at the time convinced me that taking a trip to India would be, in her words, one of the most eye-opening and soul-opening journeys of my life. And it turns out she was completely right. That's me. What do you think? You like the shaved head look? I can go back and do it right now again. Um, clearly, I got into the spirit of things very quickly uh, and fell in love with India. Uh, I had three months here and visited some of the most amazing cities in the world, Kolkata and Varanasi and Agra, and the list goes on. I even made it down here to Goa. And in that time, something unusual happened that I didn't expect. Uh, I definitely came to India as a tourist, no question about it. But I left as more of a pilgrim. Uh, India had made her mark on me somehow, and uh, I left not just loving India, but also loving the Indian people and getting a new appreciation for some of the unique technical advantages uh, of working and creating here. So in the 12 years since that time, and now looking back through the eyes of a technology innovator, uh, I look at India as an incredibly unique place for cultivating technologies. And I think India has a few advantages that are just not found anywhere else in the world. For example, you've got IIT, which is six times more selective than our own MIT at home. You've got over a billion mobile subscribers, three times as many as the US and second only to China. The largest collection of mobile developers outside of Silicon Valley. And the list goes on and on and on. But potentially, one of India's greatest assets is her founding father. So Gandhi's vision of equality, and empowerment is absolutely matchless in world history, no question about it. Now, cities and countries around the world look at Silicon Valley, and they see the wealth and the prosperity, and they seek to replicate that model here. I would argue that that's not actually what India or the rest of the world needs. For all of Silicon Valley's strengths, it's a place where technologies are cultivated with money in mind first. They're targeted at the urban elite, and then the hope is that they trickle down over time to the rest of the world. I believe that the rest of the world, and India, would benefit from an innovation ecosystem that's based more on the values of Gandhi, something that prioritizes the needs of those who have the least and brings innovation and access to everyone. Now, I know it's easy to look around you in the world and to see scarcity and hunger and all these other needs. It's easy to get pessimistic. But I actually believe that this is not the natural state of things. I think that we are currently at a unique point in human history. Right now, the pace of technical innovation is increasing. We know that, we can feel it. But it's not linear. It's starting to increase at an exponential rate. And I and many others believe in this exponential innovation. We believe that we are now at a time where as a human race, we are within grasp of being able to satisfy all of the basic human needs, food, shelter, water, energy, medicine. It's truly an incredible time to be alive. I think this is an incredible time for India, and I think the Indian culture of frugal hacking and jugad is a perfect mix for this era of exponential innovation, ensuring that all Indians, and in fact, Everyone in the world has access to all the things they need to have a happy and productive life. Now, one of those human needs that requires a great deal of fixing is healthcare. Like many of you, I believe it's a moral imperative that we address this issue, not only with new technologies, but also with a new model of care that provides access for all, whenever and wherever it's needed. Within healthcare, one of the biggest challenges is diagnostic imaging, and that's the focus of my company, specifically X-ray imaging. Now, we take them for granted, but it's important to think about this every once in a while. X-rays are one of the most important diagnostic tools in all of medicine. They're used by dozens of specialists in the diagnosis of hundreds of diseases, just a few of which are listed here. Cancers, tuberculosis, pneumonia, broken bones, head and chest injuries, and the list goes on and on and on. And now I'd like to show you a couple other numbers. Three billion, that's the number of people on Earth who have absolutely no access 
to this important technology. 40% of the global population, 400 million in India alone, nearly a third of her population. Why is this? What's up with the gap? While the global electronics industry has made incredible strides over the last 60, 70 years, continuing to miniaturize and drop cost of everything in the world that we use, the global x-ray industry has been kind of stagnant. In fact, x-rays are made pretty much the same way they were 100 years ago. And that means what we have are large pieces of equipment in centralized hospital facilities or centralized diagnostics facilities, and they're run by specialized physicians or radiologists. That puts them out of reach of many of those three billion people and many of the people in India's 600,000 rural villages. Okay, that's the big hospital systems. But then there's gotta be portable systems, right? I mean, we do have those. Well, it kinda depends on what you call portable. This is a state-of-the-art in portable imaging, a giant wheeled cart. In fact, what you're looking at there is only part of an x-ray system, that's just the head alone. Once you add in the digital detector panels and the computers and get ready for it, car batteries. These things run on car batteries. You end up with over 100 kilograms of equipment. Now, I don't know about you, but if something weighs 50% more than I do, it's not portable. This is the best the global x-ray industry can do today. Or should I say it's the best they've been able to do? Because finally, now, there's been a breakthrough. And it's due to something that we all take for granted, uh, an annoying little phenomena that we're all very familiar with. So you shuffle your feet across the carpet, you reach the doorknob, and zap! We all know this shock. We call it static electricity, but the truth is it's anything but static. Turns out it's mar far more powerful than we ever realized. And if you think about it, it makes sense. This is the same power that generates lightning, lightning bolts that go for miles and generate hundreds of millions of volts of electricity. So about 10 years ago, a group of crazy smart scientists at UCLA the guy on the left is actually my co-founder, Carlos Camera. They started thinking about static electricity in a whole new light. And in 2008, they made a fundamental breakthrough in physics, the kind of breakthrough that happens once in a generation. What they discovered was that you can use static electricity to make x-rays. But very much like the invention of the transistor that changed the electronics industry, this new way to making x-rays has tons of advantages over the way x-rays are made today. I love this shot. This is from GE's archives, 1913, about 100 years ago. And what you can see is a giant vacuum tube. There's some transformers there, huge electrical interconnects. Believe it or not, this is the exact same way that every x-ray system in the world today works. And as a result, they're expensive, they're bulky, they're plug-in power, and they're not very portable. And now, I'd like to show you something entirely new. This is M1. This is our first commercial x-ray source. It fits in the palm of your hand. It costs 1 20th of what any x-ray source in the world costs, and it's about a tenth of the size. Most important, it runs on simple 12-volt battery power. This is the transistor moment for the x-ray industry. And we are honored and humbled to have the opportunity to bring this to the world. Now, if you know anything about startups, you know that it's never a smooth ride. We've been doing this for five years. Uh, we've had our full share of ups and downs, near-death experiences, moments of elation, and we are very pleased that we survived all of that and are able to bring our very first product to market. I want to quickly show you what it is. It's called Watson. This is a handheld spectrometer. It's used by businesses to find out the materials they're dealing with, especially if you're in manufacturing or safety. And it's a critical tool. Because of our unique technology, we've been able to make it easier to use than ever before. And here's the censure, half the price. So when you cut the price that much, you put this important tool in the hands of 10 times more people, and that changes industry and makes things better. It's much more inclusive and democratizing. The reason I showed you that is that we're now taking that same approach of portability and affordability, and we're applying it towards a new kind a diagnostic healthcare tool that's designed to reach that last mile, those three billion people in the world that I talked about earlier. Now, nurses are the front line of medicine. They're usually the first person that a patient sees and when patients are in need. Our plan is to arm nurses 
with a revolutionary new tool that's superbly small and superbly easy to use. We want to skip this antiquated model where you transport a patient to a stationary diagnostic facility and instead bring the diagnostics to the patient. So I'd like to introduce something we call MODIS. MODIS, Mobile Digital Imaging System. This is a small portable system, smallest in the world. It can go anywhere, fits in a backpack, weighs less than 15 kilograms. It can take diagnostic medical imaging anywhere in the world it's needed. So whether you're an emergency aid worker or someone uh, running in a rural clinic trying to treat patients, MODIS can actually go wherever you need and deliver care. It's designed for speed of deployment, unfolds in seconds, and the primary interface is a tablet, which makes it very intuitive and easy to use for the nurse, as well as making it easy to share that information with others. Now, designing a really amazing piece of hardware is hard, and it's really great. It's a good first step. But as with so many things, the magic comes in the software. And we've designed MODIS with an intelligent, connected system that includes computer-aided diagnostics so that the nurses can actually get much of the work done without the need for a radiologist or a specialist physician. Let me show you how this is going to work. So when a nurse registers a new patient, we use biometrics to identify that patient, pull up their medical history and any relevant information. Immediately, the system starts recording the conversation between the nurse and patient and transcribing that information. It searches for keywords. In this case, leg. It starts pulling up potential exams that would be relevant in this situation. As the conversation continues, it refines that search, and ultimately, the nurse is able to select the exam she wants to perform. In this case, an image of the right tibia and fibula. Very quickly on screen, the system selects the appropriate settings and indicates a cartoon image to illustrate how to position the leg under the image. A camera, make sure that you're doing this correctly, and then with a quick click on the tablet, an image is acquired and instantly displayed on the screen. Now, we can all look and see that this is a pretty gross level fracture, but many cases aren't this clear cut. And so the system has a wireless connectivity that sends these images up to central processing, and they're analyzed in order to help diagnose. In this case, it identifies a potential tibial fracture. If the computer-aided diagnostics aren't picking up anything, the system also has the ability to refer this information out to a radiologist for teleradiology and live consult. And finally, the information can be shared wirelessly with anybody necessary, including hospitals, clinics, and other people involved. I hope you'll agree that this represents the potential to have a paradigm shift in the way healthcare is rendered, especially in that last mile environment. We talk a lot about the increasing role of nurses in the new model of healthcare, and I think it's very important because we have an acute doctor shortage that's just not going to get solved. In India, in particular, only 33% of working age women are employed. That's less than half the regional average for this part of the world. I think there's a tremendous opportunity and a call to action to help get more and more women in the workforce. This will give these women education and a sense of purpose and an ability to help impact the lives of so many more people. So I'd like to make sure that we all take that away with us and try to keep this cause going. I think it's an important one. So in conclusion, um, this is just one example of a dramatic technology that we can all employ. I'm sure there's a lot of other amazing solutions coming out around the world. Uh, I did want to show one final thing to you. Do you remember that x-ray source that fits in the palm of your hand? Well, we didn't stop there. Our next generation is even smaller. In fact, I have it with me right now. This is the world's smallest x-ray source. Thank you. A lot of very smart people are responsible for putting this together. And in the spirit of collaboration, I'd like to call on all of you in the audience and everyone listening to this to help us develop that next generation of technologies that exploits this in order to bring healthcare and diagnostics to everyone in the world, wherever they may be, regardless of their ability to provide them themselves. Thank you all.